Why is the blockchain such a big deal? Is it because of the magic internet money and the Bitcoins and the Moon Boys and the Lambo and the next coming get rich quick scheme? No, it's not. The blockchain is much more than cryptocurrency, which is just but one application. The blockchain is such a big deal because it provides the potential of offering a property rights system for the digital age. And that is a big one. Until now, the digital age doesn't have a property rights system. They are, it's, it's very difficult to own data, to own information. And the blockchain provides that solution. Now, if that information is a currency, call it cryptocurrencies. But there's many other things you can own and give ownership to with regards to data and information. And that is a really big deal. Now, that also will come with all the implications of a property owning system with regard to its economic implications, which finally truly will unleash the power of the digital age. We haven't seen, seen nothing yet with the social implication, also with its power redistribution uh, implications and with inequality. All of these things come with a property registration system. And that actually is what the blockchain is about. So let's have a look to, to, to understand why it is such a big deal. We pull back the big curtain and start well from the beginning of technological innovations when we transform, started to learn to transform matter with the Stone Age, Bronze Age. Then we in the Industrial Revolutions, we learned to transform energy. And now we are getting the hang of transforming information. So we went from matter to energy to information. And this is the Schumpeterian framework of from innovation theory. I kindly, if, if, if you are not familiar with that, please check out these, these other uh, lectures here to see what that is about. And that's how innovation theorists like I look at that. Technology is the driver of societal progress, of economic, social, cultural, all of that together, of progress. That's what distinguished us from the rest of the animals, and we surely, even if evolution, the biological evolution is extremely slow, we have evolved in the last hundred years only, hundreds of years, because of technological innovation. So we evolved with that. So that's how we usually look at that. And that's the framework that, had, that we have been used in this uh, entire set of lectures. Now, this is Schumpeter, the prophet of innovation, as they call him. But there are other economists that say like, no, no, that is not correct. We could organize it completely differently. For example, this gentleman, Douglas North, he won the Nobel Prize in economics. And for what? The Nobel Prize Committee said he won it because he argued that technical innovations alone are insufficient to propel economic development. Technological innovations are insufficient? It's from innovation theorists, like, you know, that's blasphemy, right? Why is technology not enough? What else is needed there, Professor North? Tell us. Well, this book is called Institution Property Rights and Economic Growth. So it's about property rights, he said. And he distinguishes two different periods here. He said the first economic revolution is the agricultural revolution. He says it was a revolution because the transition created for mankind an incentive change of fundamental proportions. So we got moving because we got incentivized. Why did we get incentivized? Well, because we finally owned something and that really got our ego going and got us going. Before that, if you think back, we were all living in tribes. And also when Europeans came to, to encounter tribes that didn't have the European ideal. Well, the indigenous tribes here in Americas, for example, they could say like, you cannot own land. You cannot own land. The earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. So they didn't understand how could you own a piece of land? And what? well, we came here and we said, no, you can own land. And that is what Professor North means. It got us really motivated. There was an incentive. Once we could own land, matter, any kind of matter, raw material and so forth, natural resources, we get really incentivized. So that got the economic revolution going. So we learned how to dominate matter and we invented the plow back in the Stone Age and well, the Iron Age and the Bronze Age and so forth. And we started to work the land. But the argument here is only once we 
owned this matter, once we had a property rights organization system, then we really unleashed the economic potential of it. And something similar happens what Douglas North calls the second economic revolution, the industrial revolution. So the industrial revolution is about energy, let's say the transformation of potential. And there we also had a property rights system that unleashed potential. We call it the intellectual property rights system. And the question is now, what and is there a property rights system for the digital age, for the age where we manipulate in information. So let's say again, in the first economic revolution, the agricultural revolution, we had property of matter, land, for example, but also you could, uh, you could own metals and natural resources and oil, and it's still very important. If you own a lot of oil, well, that is beneficial. We still, it's a big economic incentive. In the second economic revolution, we own potential ideas. Edison, the biggest inventor of intellectual property, more than a thousand patents, all of these patents and so forth. So these are potential ideas that you can implement. That's during the age where we started to harness energy, which is actually also potential. Potential. And the question now is, can we have property of symbols? Symbols, data, it doesn't even have to be information. Maybe we can just own data and symbols. We could also own information and the knowledge, which provides meaning to them. But is there a property system in order to manage that? Well, spoiler alert, there is, and it's called the blockchain. So that's what the potential, that's why the blockchain is such a big deal. Now, I could now go into and explain more of that, but, but I want to maybe in this quick, in this quick set of lectures, go the other way around. So how could you own symbols? Like how can you own data? That is a, that's a crazy thing because if you have a, a, a data, a symbol, I could just copy it. And actually in the digital age, I use the right, right mouse button, copy, paste. So there it is. Who knows if it was yours or it's mine, it's a digital copy. So how could you, how could you own information and how could you own data and how can you not distinguish it from from the data I just copied from you. Like what is, how, how could that be? Well, instead of now explaining to you how the blockchain solves it, what I will do in these kind of lectures is we do it the other way around. We ask ourselves, what does it mean to have property? And I invite you to go in these, in these two, three lectures to go with me through inventing a really good property rights system, like the best one we could theoretically think of. And it has all the good components that it needs. And spoiler alert, once we have all of that and we work through it and we came up with the best property rights system we can theoretically imagine, it will turn out that is the blockchain. And that's why the blockchain is such a big deal. It allows us to give property even to something like data and information. So. Let's invent our own system and let's make it a good one. Let's make it a really good one. All right, ready? Let's get going. What do we need to have property? Let's think about that. To have property, there's first me, good old me. I, we were, became self-aware as humans and we realized there's a me. Some animals are self-aware, but at the beginning we started to become self-aware and we created the story of the ego. So there's the me. And then, you know, apart from the animals, we also want to have property because we have something. Some animals have property, monkeys, for example, could own a stick. But for us, it became very important because we wanted to attach that to the me, to our perception of self. So we added this property to it, made our egos bigger and whoa, did that motivate us because then we became bigger. And once we became bigger, we can defend ourselves better. It provides fitness in an evolutionary sense. So that's great. So then there's me and I have something. And then the me, my perception of self is bigger. I am bigger because I have all of these things. So I have something. Now, I could walk around with this something and always hold on to it. That's how I can really show that I have it. I have my sack of gold in the Wild West, right? And I better like I better put it under my pillow when I sleep because like how can I how can I have this property? Let's think about it. Like how can you hold on to this property? Well, you always have to hold it hold it in your hand, right? You have to like grab onto it. If a monkey owns a stick and leaves it laying around, another monkey takes it. I mean, where how would the monkey claim that it was his stick or her stick or so how could we be hold but that is very inconvenient if you have bigger properties and you have a lot of properties you cannot hold on to you cannot fill your pockets with them or like imagine you own a car like how could you like that would be very inconvenient oh so what we came up with is a certificate of ownership so we have some certificate of ownership and that's there and then 
I, I have my car there, but if my car is gone, I still have the paper. And I better keep the paper in my pocket or somewhere else with somebody I trust, but I need the certificate of ownership. So that's the first part. In a property right system, I need some kind of information. So the certificate of ownership is basically a database. It's information. First component, an information record. That's what we need. In blockchain lingo, that's called the ledger. Second, what I need? Well, there's you. And you also have something and you also have a certificate of ownership that's also here on the ledger, on the information record. Now, what if we trade and I give you something and then you become bigger and I become smaller and now you have something and I have nothing. So in order to be able to do that, we also have to distinguish between you and me on this ledger. And we have to make sure that we really know that it's you and that it's me. Because otherwise I could say like, oh, yeah, you gave me something. And it's like, no, no, I never agreed on that. So we really need to know who is who in that game because I cannot speak for you and you cannot speak for me. So you have to certify that, yes, uh, I gave this to you and you and I have to certify I gave it to you. Like, really, it's me, it's me. I became smaller, that's, that's painful. So I better make sure that I agree with that. So we need to verify who is who, sure. Now imagine then you trade it back to me. Now that becomes confusing because then if I wouldn't know when that happened, I could also say like, oh, no, 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 you, you gave that to me already yesterday. And I said, no, no, you were about to give it to me. Like, oh, no, but I already gave it to you. Like, I don't have it here. Like, oh, you don't have it. Like, but so you need to also verify when things happen because otherwise things get really confusing. Or if you say, well, I give you, I don't know, something, but I already got sold it to somebody else too. And I don't have it in my bank account. That's the problem of double spending when the check bounces. So you have to know, like, did you spend the money already? Or is it still in the bank? So we need a, a time registry there as well. So an information record, we need to know who and we need to know when. These are the first three basic components that any property rights system needs to have. And now we want to make it a good one. And that is a really good one. We do that without a need for a trusted third party. Because usually these certificates of ownership, where are they at? For example, your certificate of ownership of a car, where is it at? Well, you have a little paper that, oh, do you still have that? That little paper, that ownership of your car? Maybe you have it, maybe you don't have it. But even if you lost that little piece of paper that shows that you own that car, there is a registry at here in the United States would be the Department of Motor Vehicles the DMV, and if your car is stolen and you even lost this paper because something, maybe something bad happened, your house burned down, you can still go to the DMV and say like, well, this car is mine. It's registered under my name. And you pay a handsome amount just to keep track of this property of this car. And you have to pay the registration every few years. And in most countries of the world, that's how it is. If you have like a big property, like a car, you need to register it. And then this trusted third party for us here, it's the Department of Motor Vehicle that keeps the record and it charges for that. Now, what if I want to do that without the DMV, without the trusted third party? Well, the solution here is we make many, 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 many copies. So even if one copy gets lost and you lose your paper and the DMV loses its paper, there are still many more copies. Because that's the problem. What if the house of the DMV burns down or their server crashes and their database gets deleted? So if we have so many copies that it's impossible to take them all out, even if a hacker would like to attack them, then we can do that without a trusted third party. So that's the trick. That's the trick there. So long story short, what does it mean to have property? Well, we have a ledger. We have an information record where we have to register ownership. Second, we verify who, and we do that with digital signatures. Now that's a 1970s technology, that's, but it works really well. Digital signatures are at the core of the blockchain and we will talk about the awesome things they do. And then I need to verify when. So we need timestamps and we see like, oh, I gave it to you in the morning and in the afternoon you gave it to somebody else. So we keep track of when things happen so nobody can cheat with, oh, I already gave it to you. And we actually chain them together. That's where the blockchain comes from. And that has amazing properties. And then we chain them together. And this has amazing properties. It is this chaining together. That's where the blockchain is coming from. Uh, and this, the timestamp, the chained timestamps is the verification of when. And these are the basic ingredients. And Satoshi Nakamoto, who, who they 
wrote the white paper of Bitcoin, the first practical application of the blockchain. Also, that's how Nakamoto started. We define an electronic coin as a chain of digital signatures, period. It's a chain of digital signatures. So that's how you guys started. But the innovation with Bitcoin as the first application of the blockchain was that they proposed to do it in a distributed manner and agreed. So there is a consensus algorithm that agrees on what goes onto the blockchain. And therefore, there is no need for a trusted third party. And that makes it a really good property. And some prop a property rights system that is as good that it can register the property of data. And hence, it is a really amazing candidate of becoming the technological solution as for the property rights system of the digital age. Now, the blockchain provides the technological solution to offer a property rights system that it allows to give property to information. And that's a really big deal. At least we have some registry we can register. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't solve the technological adoption problem. So just because you have something that's technologically possible doesn't mean that society adopted it. So the blockchain right now is still diffusing and it might or might not be completely adopted. We don't know yet. Now it's diffusing extremely quickly. So many people think it's a pretty good bet that we more sooner than later will have adopted it. And while this diffusion happens, there's a lot of economic possibilities that can be exploited. And this diffusion process then also creates a process of creative destruction. New institutions need to be created. And there are a lot of other lectures, please check them out, uh, where we talk about how that process happens, which is a more, more economic and social institutional adjustment process, which is also very important. But of course, for example, just because you have a registry of data, you just have it's a paper or a digital ledger where it says that you, it's yours, this thing is yours, well, then you can say, hey, it's mine. And, and what are you going to do? Cry about it if, if nobody gives it to you? So there still needs to be an institutional structure that then executes and gives you the property. And maybe even the police has to come in and go in and say like, no, this is not your property. This is the property of this other person. So somebody, humans still need to execute it. So an information registry alone doesn't solve that. And I want to be very clear. But the blockchain has the potential or it is providing a technolo an ingenious technological solution to give property to information. And that is the absolutely necessary but not sufficient condition to provide a property rights system for the digital age.